everyone welcome to the session for today and today our session is on the pecking order theory and its relevance in during the pandemic right now before we start off with this topic we first need to understand this concept of optimal capital structure this particular session has been designed for people who don't know anything about what is pecking order theory what is finance so this is a very basic session right so we will be going through the very basic details of our topic today so that everyone can understand what this is right so the first thing that we will do is understand optimal capital structure then we will look into how the pandemic has affected the interest rates how has it how has it impacted the stock market and then finally we will comment on the pecking order theory right um, can you go on to the next slide right now first thing the main objective of any business is to enhance the value of its firm this is what the objective is this is what the objective of corporate finance actually is that how do does your firm grow now this value of the firm is formed of the value of your debt and the value of your equity debt means that you take bank loans or you issue bonds and equity means shares now the question which arises is that what proportion of debt and what proportion of equity do you intend to use all right in this first pie chart over here you can see that this is a debt to equity of 60 to 40 which means 60% debt 40% equity and over here in the second pie chart you can see that the debt to equity is 40 to 60 right so how do we take this decision that is the important thing now um there are a number of factors that can affect this decision right this can be attributable to the way your company works yeah it can also be attributable to the nature of your business the size of your business all of these factors affect that we will be discussing that in a bit more detail but first i would like to discuss on the next slide just give me a moment this one that does an increase in debt affect the share price of your firm right now the point is this that if your organization is able to avail debt right from any financial institution it does give a very positive signal to the market <clears throat> and it does affect your share price because investors what they do is they look at it as a very positive signal that your company has got some really good <clears throat> sorry about that has got some really good career prospects or financial prospects because a financial institution would never lend out a 3 4 or 5 year loan to a business which it feels does not has the ability to survive they will only lend a loan of let's say 3 years 4 years 5 years 10 years to a business when it is confirmed that you know this company has got some really good prospects and we can see that that they are growing now having said that i think i would like to pass on this question to you guys so keith can you tell me how important is debt for a company 
what is your opinion on debt? Uh, uh, so forgive me. Um, um, well, it, it, it's important. Well, well, the way we view debt, and I try to sort of hold the line on this one, is that we view debt um, as a way to finance growth, okay. i.e. I, I, uh, in, in contrast with viewing debt um, as a way of financing our day-to-day -day operations. I want That's... our day-to-day -day operations to be completely financed by um, our, our normal, as it were, uh, uh, revenue from sales. And so any debt which we uh, incur, i.e. a bank loan, for example, I want it to be firmly understood and therefore firmly acted upon that that debt, uh, that debt is to finance growth. For example, Very good. the new markets um, and associated activities, uh, for example, uh, taking on new staff in order to move into those new markets. All right. So if your company is growing, right, how will you use debt? I mean, let's say if you want to justify that, you know, we want to grow our business. So how will you grow? Can you give me an, an examples of growth? Uh, yeah, you know, we, um, we're a small consultancy company. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, uh, all our market at the moment is in this country. Okay. Um, and we want to explore and hopefully move into tapping markets, take advantage of uh, overseas markets. Okay. Okay. That's very good. Um, That's USA, very good. USA, Middle East, Far East, and so on. So we've taken on um, an intern. He, she will be for three months over the summer, basically to, uh, to explore how we might do that. All right. So if I give you one let's say one instance let's say you want to redesign your website right because obviously you want your website to be more globally attractive would you use debt to redesign your website um, um, uh, yes we would if, if the purpose of that redesign was mm -hmm. to as I've described and did as you've um, as you've noted to move into that new market if it was simply a redesign of the website in order mm -hmm. just to be, uh, you know, slightly more effective in terms of accessing our current markets, mm -hmm. I would what not. I would not want debt to finance that. Exactly. Very good. That's the important point. V wonderful. Wonderful, Keith. We'll build upon this discussion as we go on ahead. Okay. So I also have with us uh, Havnish. Is that correct? Henwish. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yes. All right. Right. So can you tell me uh, something about your business or what do you do? Uh, my business? Yeah. Oh, no. I'm actually a doctoral researcher at the moment at Brunel University. All right. Okay. So, yeah, I'm just attending just to, because I'm looking at the access to finance for SMEs, for example. So we're looking at how businesses grow in terms of the access to finance difficulties, how they actually overcome those problems to grow. All right, so yeah. that begins big, big, a very important question for, to you. How important is debt for the survival of SMEs? Um, actually, I would say that it actually depends on how you're gonna access those finance and how they are willing to give us that finance to mm -hmm. be able to grow our business. Um, yeah, so I think that is important, but when doing research and analyzing the debt finance, we can see that there's a gap there that they only finance the growth of the business. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I would say that it's quite important, but uh, at start, it's quite difficult. Yes, so what we're actually trying to say is that companies that are less than five years old will struggle to get finance irrespective of the size, whether they are small or whether they're medium. Yes. And companies that are more than five years old, they will have a better chance of securing debt finance in comparison to those firms. Yes. Yeah. That is mainly because of what? It is mainly because of financial track record. Yeah. Companies that are less than five years old, they have no demonstrable record as such, to be honest, 
right? And companies that are more than five years old can show their data to you and say that, look, this is what we have been earning in the last five years. And then what the bank can do is that it can make a projection based upon what they have earned, right? But having said to that, another major problem with SMEs is that, especially for the small sector, small enterprises, they are not subject to so many co cooperative, uh, I mean like um, what we say, financial statements publishing as yes. medium enterprises. But, but they don't, yeah. yeah. Mm. Right? Yeah. So having said that, the bottom line is that debt is very important for a company. There's no doubt in that. And uh, majority of the businesses use debt for growing purposes right and they would not like to use debt for operational purposes just like keith mentioned mm -hmm. but having said that we have to decide at what is the maximum level of debt that should be there in an organization that is the key decision for any corporate financial manager right so um let me move on to the next slide and show you what I precisely mean is this table. <coughs> Sorry. Now, what do we see over here? Let me explain this table to you guys. This particular table over here is representing ungeared firm value. So this basically means that this organization without any debt, without any debt, the value of its equity stands at 12 million pounds. One of the biggest advantages of debt is that debt is tax deductible, which means you do not pay any tax on debt. So for instance, if you take a debt of 1.5 million pounds, assuming 30% is a tax rate, so you are able to save 450,000 pounds in tax benefits if you take a debt, okay? If this was shares, you will be paying this as tax. Since this is debt, you are able to save 450,000 pounds worth of tax. Bankruptcy cost at this point in time is zero because with a value of 12 million, if you take 1.5 million pounds worth of debt, doesn't really give you a very high bankruptcy cost. Now let's assume you said that no 1.5 million pounds was insufficient. Let's take some more debt. Let's move to 3 million pounds, right? In this case over here, you can see that 3 million, 30% of 3 million means you were able to save 900,000 pounds, but now you are incurring a bankruptcy cost because now the level of debt is increasing. So this is what, this is 240,000 pounds. So what does this imply? This implies that as you tend on borrowing more, your interest rate APR is going to start increasing at every level. So how do we get this value? 12 million plus 900,000, because that is your tax benefit, minus the bankruptcy cost of 240,000, will give you what 12.66 million as your value of the firm. So this is the value of the geared firm, 12.66 million. Now the interesting thing to note here is that as your level of debt starts increasing, your value of the firm is decreasing. Why? Because though you are able to save more money from tax benefits as you go down from 3 million to 10.5 million, your bankruptcy cost is multiplying significantly as well. So at 10.5 million pound worth of debt, though you are able to save 3.15 million in tax benefits, your bankruptcy cost has now increased towards 6.825 million. Bringing your value of the firm down to 8.325 that is what we say is the optimal capital structure decision that at 3 million pound worth of debt, the value of the firm was maximum, right? So this is something that an entrepreneur has to decide that where do I cut off, 
where do I say that, okay, this is the maximum value of debt that I am going to go ahead with. This one over here, okay? Now, having said that, this is not a very easy decision. It's a very difficult decision. Why? Because at the end of the day, you would understand that there are so many lenders out there that they are in the business to lend money to. They will not stop lending money to you until and unless you default or you show some really poor financial record. The only way they're signal to you is that they'll be offering you high interest rates. So at the end of the day, it's your decision, right? So this is something that you have to do. Now, let's discuss what are the factors. Right, now, as I said, banks or financial institutions are in a business of lending out money. So they cannot be compared with, let's say, a retail outlet. They cannot be compared with, let's say, you know, any clothes manufacturing company. They are in a separate business. So firm specific factors such as profitability, size, tangibility of assets, liquidity, all of that matters. Keith, I have a very interesting question for you, if you may answer me. I've heard that right now, many companies in UK are maintaining an extremely high level of liquidity because of the uncertainty in the market. Is that true? Um, um, well, um, yes, uh, I, I guess uh, sort of empirical, including anecdotal evidence says that because when we all went into lockdown, you know, particularly uh, the retail sector, people were just very unsure about whether, you know, the, the customers, you know, would be purchasing um, services or goods. So um, mm -hmm. uh, companies understandably said, well, we want to try and keep our employees, keep our stock. So, you know, cash is king. So, yes, I think at the beginning, I think that's now changing. I think as we're coming out of lockdown, people, uh, companies are making decisions about going back to what they see as their normal um, cash reserve levels. Yes, Keith, but there is also one more factor here, which we are tending to forget because of the lockdown scenario, which is Brexit. And unfortunately, it even before the lockdown, because of the uncertainty due to Brexit, even companies were not investing in mega projects. Would you agree to that? Um, yes, I think investment has been postponed. Yeah. So this is what actually right now the scenario actually is. That's a, that's exactly the point that I wanted to put forward. Whenever there is risk in the market you will see a high level of liquidity on the financial statements of companies because they are not willing to invest lots and lots amount of or huge amount of investments, right? So this is what liquidity is. Now let's come to another thing, which is stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers. These also play a very important role when determining the capital structure. How? Let's talk about Curry's PC World, you know. They, and along with I think it's Harvey's also as well, give six months uh, pay payment plan to their customers, right? So what happens in this case is that customers have got six months to make any payment on their purchases after six months they will be in, uh, incur interest rates if they do not clear that balance up. So if you are in a situation like that, then obviously your capital structure will be different. Similarly, when you come to industry factors, which is also very uh, important, technological firms, data has shown struggle the most to get any sorts of bank financing, especially during the startup phases. So, Hanvisha, do you have any experience of that, of startup firms, how they struggle to get financing? There are many SMEs that are, start, that are in the technology business. 
I can't hear you, Anvisha. I think your mic is muted. Yes, yes, yes. That's correct. Actually, even for high growth innovative firms, we struggle a lot for to get their finance. Exactly, um, and this is precisely why you have fintech. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now there comes another very important part here, which I want to discuss with both of you. Country factors. How does that affect the capital structure decision? Yes, Anvisha, can you give me some light on that? Um, yeah, I would say country factors, especially the institutional environment, actually plays a big part uh, mm -hmm. in our capital structures of firms. And, um, but that would actually uh, um, differentiate between the developed and developing market as well. Yeah. So, for example, in developing market, we have poor infrastructure, we have poor um, financial uh, instruments for uh, firms. Mm -hmm. And they have a less variety, according to uh, research that was done uh, before, they mm -hmm. have a less uh, financing um, sources to actually access and be able to grow their business and have a good capital structure moving along their business life cycle, for example. So yeah, I would say uh, unlike um, a country like UK where they're better in infrastructure and lots of uh, lots of being done for them, even the government policy. So yeah, it does affect, I would very say. Very good, exactly, very good. Keith, I now come to you and I want to discuss this particular one with you, stock markets, because you were talking about growing into other markets. So let's assume you want to grow into the Middle East market, right? How will that affect the capital structure decision? Um, well, you know, fairly simply, fairly simply stated is that um, um, we may need um, um, more funds, more cash, uh, greater liquidity mm. to, for example, um, um, hire somebody in the Middle East who could act as an agent for us. Very you know, good. That person will, you know, quite right, will want payments, will be expenses in that. So, uh, and in, in order to gain access to that cash uh, mm -hmm. finance to do that, we may have to uh, um, 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 and borrow money from a bank, commercial bank. All right. So let me put the question to you in this way, Keith. Do you think selling shares on the stock exchanges of the Middle Eastern uh, countries, let's say UAE, Saudi Arabia, is that the same as selling shares on London Stock Exchange? Well, I imagine, I, 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 I don't know anything it, about you know, the Middle East stock markets, but I guess yeah. it is different, you know, you know, in terms of in, in terms of investor yes. protection, for example, in terms exactly. of stock market regulations, disclosure, and so it, on and so on. Exactly. That is the important point. Very good. The level of protection, the level of disclosure here in UK, in Europe, in American, uh, in America, is a lot more than that of you see in the Middle Eastern economies. Here, stock markets are very thoroughly regulated, right? So, what happens actually here is that when you go to especially Middle East, and if you want to get some investment, you are more likely to go to a high net worth individual, asking him or her to invest money into your business rather than selling shares on the stock exchange in UAE. So this is exactly how things are different when you go to other less developed markets, right? Then you also have this one factor, which is time. This is what we are discussing right now, honestly speaking. How does time affect our ability to make this capital structure decision? How does that affect us? For that, I would now like to invite you guys to comment on one particular graph. Just give me a moment, which is here. Now, Keith, I'll ask you this question again. What is your interpretation when you look at this graph? What do you think about it? 
और हनवीशा कैन यू टेल मी व्हाट डू यू सी पैंडेमिक Um, so you know they've gone from whatever it was five percent, six percent in two thousand and seven, two thousand and nine down to is it half point five percent there? Stayed there for a significant period of time, gone down, gone up again. Yeah, and and they're now down to is it zero point one percent and potentially negative interest rates. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's very important. You are going to have negative interest rates. It's pretty much on the cards. If you study Financial Times regularly, you would find that you have very, very a lot of analysts commenting on the possibility of having a negative interest rates in the UK. I think after a very long time. Now comes another important question: Do you think accessing bank finance is easier in these circumstances? Yes, Hanvisha. What do you think? Uh, I can't hear you, Anvisha. You need to unmute. Uh, I would say that uh, accessing bank finance during this time, um, I'm not too sure about it actually. Okay, I'll I'll help you with this. You see, we have a concept which is called as credit rationing. Yeah. Right. What is credit rationing? Is the banks what they do is they limit the amount of funds that they will actually lend out to the market right now why i asked you specifically regarding this graph is because honestly speaking hanvisha smes will struggle the most in times like these okay so when you're looking at this like this scenario from 2009 to 2020 21 you would find that smes are actually going to struggle the most because they are considered as high risk yes yes this is not to say that even the bigger firms will very easily avail finance yes they will be able to easily avail finance but the amount of money that they want to borrow they will have difficulty in that So at this particular point in time here, let's say, let's assume in two thousand and seven, where the interest rates were touching six percent, right? Let's say if a company wanted to borrow ten million pounds worth of debt, it wouldn't have a problem. But the same company will get debt in two thousand nine, but not more than four million or five million, because what happens is that this graph also shows you. a slow down in economic activity right so if in this particular point in time you were able to justify that the cash flows of my firm are expected to grow at let's say 3% 3.5% 4.5% per year in this point in time you will say that now my cash flow is going to you know grow at 0.5% 0.25% which is precisely why the bank of england then decreases the interest rates all right so this is how it is so yes debt financing becomes cheaper but it becomes more competitive due to credit rationing and as a result of this smes will struggle the most Okay um Hanvisha can you also tell me what about the business loan interruption scheme have you done any research on the mm-hmm. fact that how are companies accessing that uh, no actually uh, i'm looking at the alternative financing when they're not actually getting debt finance so for example we're looking at the crowdfunding 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at the venture capitalist uh, market or even the bank uh, business angel. So how okay. are those different sources of finance actually overcoming the problem of bank financing? Okay, so that's also very important because alternative finance will only arise when bank financing is hard to get. Right? It's actually a fallback position, alternative finance, which normally arises when an entrepreneur gets disheartened when he sees two, three, four applications go down yes. from banks. Yes. Right? That is why we call that as alternative financing. Yes. Now, so this is precisely the interest rates. Now let's talk about the FTSE All Share Index, which is very, very interesting. Yes, Keith. Can you comment on this graph? What do you see here? Uh, well, obviously it shows um, um, the, the FTSE 100 measure, um, mm. obviously significantly decreasing, um, I don't know, around about March, uh, when the impact of the uh, pandemic, the impact of the virus was becoming obvious. Yes, um, very good. Then, Lockdown, a significant mm -hmm. drop down to whatever the lowest point was on that graph, uh, slightly less than five thousand. Yeah, and obviously it's mm -hmm. been it's been going up slightly, uh, you know, from that low point up until whatever it is today. Um, as lockdown has it, decreased, and therefore as economic activity has increased, and um, uh, people who buy and sell uh, the hundred shares, um, as represented here. Um, gain great very good greater confidence or less confidence greater confidence and they're obviously willing to spend more money on individual shares hence the value going up exactly that is the important point that Keith just mentioned that this particular point where you see all the way coming down to the rock bottom is what the pandemic this is at the time when the lockdown was enforced and now as things have started to improve lockdown is easing up you can see that this graph is going here but Keith, the important question that I want to ask you is, do you think that this graph will reach again this point here of 7,500 in the next six months? Um, no. Do you think I, that is going to happen? I, not within the next six months, no. Not within the next six months, exactly. So what does that show? Let me be honest here. This is showing a very high level of standard deviations. Honestly speaking, for, a, for an index such as FTSE 100 index, these 100 firms are the top performing firms on the FTSE, right? So if they are so volatile, then how do you expect an SME can go and sell shares on the stock exchange? It will be even very, very more difficult for them right because for for light like, like i said these firms here they have been trading here since the last almost 100 years if a certain point in time comes that you know the share prices are dropping in this manner it really is not a very big setback for them they will rebound again because of the strong performance of their companies but for an sme they will become bankrupt or they can you know almost close down if they see such drop in their prices now with that we come to this particular one what is the pecking order theory now let me explain this to you guys the pecking order theory says that whenever you need finance for your firm number one is internally generated funds which means retained profits right so this says that you must use your retained profit as your first priority this is the number one step that you should take if these are insufficient right then you go for taking debt from the market if debt is also insufficient then you go about taking new equity now, 
what the pecking order theory states is that selling shares in the market is perceived as bad news. It actually means that you are short of funds because of internally generated funds are short and your borrowing capacity is also limited. There is a line of least resistance and there is transaction cost because selling shares on the stock market is expensive. According to the pecking order theory, there is no target debt to equity ratio. So there's no such thing as a target debt capital structure. And profitable companies use less debt. Now this is another thing that I would like to ask Keith. Keith, do you agree with the statement? Profitable firm use less debt. No. No? Why is that? Yeah, because, um, well, you know, in a theoretical sense, I don't know about it empirically, but in a theoretical sense, you know, it could well be that the profit, uh, historic profit, and therefore projected profit is to, to a certain extent, to a great extent, driven by um, good use of debt, i.e. Really in the good. past, growth has been funded by debt. And therefore, mm -hmm. you borrow now in order to um, drive growth and profit in the future. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Exactly. Oops, sorry. Okay. Now, what about you, Hanvisha? Do you think profitable firms use less debt? I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, actually, I was thinking about it. Actually, that's a good, interesting point for a pecking order theory, saying that profitable firms uh, use less uh, debt. Perhaps it's because they don't want to have much expenses, mm -hmm. and that will actually decrease their profit if they take and have to pay interest rate on top mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a there's several factors that we need to, like it needs to be considered that for that statement to be actually true and more empirical evidence need to confirm that. Right, you know, why we have this point is let me tell you something very interesting. Okay. Like I said that, you know, in the first initial years, when a company is surviving, right? They're unable to use debt because it's very difficult for them to get debt. Like Keith said that those companies that have grown, right, have used debt in a very, you know, profitable manner, or they have used debt very carefully. But here again, the key word is grown. Right? So the words that he used was those companies that have grown over the past. So you are actually talking about firms that are 20 years old. And in the last 10 years, they were able to get debt and they use that constructively for their growth purposes, right? So this is precisely what actually, like I said, the point is that it depends upon which, what life cycle are you in? Of the age life cycle of the firm are you in? The younger you are, the more difficult it is for you, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to ask because I'm using the business across the business life cycle and using the picking order theory to test all of this. Mm -hmm. Do you think that at each picking particular stages, the pecking order theory holds based on a firm perspective? So for example, um, what I want to ask is at early stage, do they still choose from internal then debt, then equity, and mm -hmm. then while they are moving along, they still, uh, um, they still do the pecking and have a high uh, preferences of financing. Okay, so, let me answer you that to my knowledge because I've been researching SMEs as well. You see, in the initial years, in the initial years, like I said, the first five years, it is very difficult to get any form of financing, right? So what happens is that in the first five years, they are stuck with internal profits. 
or alternative financial uh, you know options the first five years then what happens is like i said it's all about giving signals to the market as well once you have crossed that big problem of the first five years then you go ahead right and you are able to secure debt sometimes sometimes you will take a debt even if it's for a small amount from a leading bank let's say lloyds or barclays just to convince the market that you know even the biggest lenders in the market trust our potential so that also happens a lot that as you go along what happens is that you start taking on debt just to show to the market and the reality is apart from let's say the financial institution sector which is banks and insurance companies and all let's talk about automobiles let's talk about retail generally speaking they have debt between debt to equity ratio of between 65% to 75% debt to 25% to 35% equity they actually want to show the signal to the market that you know lenders do trust us and it helps a lot as well because what happens is if you read the annual report right over there they will always mention who are their bankers mm -hmm. especially this happens in a lot of asian economies as well that you know on the second or third page of the annual report they'll mention that these are the bankers that banks that we are working with them they want to show that you know even the strongest financial institutions have trust in our abilities so that's how it is but having said that um keith i have one more question to you over here that i would like to ask you right now you see that many of the firms such as marks and spencer debenhams yeah both of these i am concerned they have given profit warnings and they have said that you know there's a high likelihood that they might close down much of their operations do you think it's because of excessive debt that they have taken in the last few years um i i i i, I well I, i don't know what their levels of debt are but i i, I imagine that's a, a a contributive factor having said that i think that factor is far outweighed by basically um um in the past three months okay. a significant drop in sales and also and again i don't know the particular issues associated with those two companies but with high street shops generally the move away from high street sales to online sales so really um, you know I, i i i i don't know those two but i can't imagine companies like that would have taken out so much debt that that would become a significant factor um, okay in their running into financial problems okay okay that's fine that's fine okay thank you keith i think i also have janet with me hello janet uh can you unmute yes janet can you tell me something about your business um i'm a bit like keith i have a business consultancy um i'm also the co-founder of the wolverhampton black business network so we work with a lot of smes um and right now they are struggling greatly to come out of the lockdown all right that is very imp that is very interesting janet you are talking about smes that are struggling a lot so what uh, how would you say i uh, have they applied for any business loan interruption schemes or there have been so many you know mortgage payment holidays have they applied for that yes some 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 have and some have been successful and others haven't been very successful um at the moment it's the chancellor parties in the retail and hospitality sector mm -hmm. uh, so we're just hoping that um i know at least one of the businesses we've got about 200 businesses in the network and what, one of them definitely has come back to me and said they've been successful in gaining some grants through that particular scheme 
Mm. Um, other ones are very much doing what you're saying is looking at how they can generate income internally. Um, I don't think any of them are trying to take on any kind of debt from the bank because as you previously said, historically the bank just won't lend to them. Exactly. So here you see here and Visha is some evidence that I was talking about that though you may see in this graph here that, you know, sorry, um, my laptop stucks a lot. That though the interest rate has gone down, it does not necessarily mean that everyone is easily able to get bank financing. No. This graph has gone down. Why? Because it is showing that there is a decrease in economic activity. And then you can hear from Janet also as well that many small and medium enterprises are not able to get bank financing. Right? So, <clears throat> now, um, Janet, can you tell me that what sectors are most firms in, in, the, uh, in your uh, black county? I mean, like, which sectors do they belong to? It's a cross section. They don't particularly belong to any one sector. I think traditionally people believe that they do hairdressing or they run food shops, um, takeaways. But to be perfectly fair, we have accountants, we have solicitors, we have people that are tutoring, home tutoring. And one of them has had to move from face to face tutoring to online tutoring in a rapid speed. So I've been mentoring her with that. So we have a cross sector of businesses. It's not one type of business in the sector. All right, okay. So uh, that is uh, also exactly, I agree with you that um, there's a diverse business over there and uh, people have to have changed a lot of their business styles, to be honest. Those who took, you know, online advertising, online marketing, very lightly initially, they have to now forced on selling their products online and to coming to face-to-face -to -face te uh, online teaching also as well. So Janet, can you tell me, do you think they are following the pecking order, which is using internally generated funds first? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. And what is their opinion on debt financing? Have they complained to you? Have they told you? that how difficult is it, it is to get, you know, a finance from a bank? Yes, we did a piece of work um, five years ago with um, CREM, which is the Center for Research into Ethnic Minority um, Entrepreneurship. And the piece of work that we did with them identified how difficult it is for SMEs, especially black businesses to gain finance from the bank and that position hasn't changed um, so you know there's, there's that piece of research out there that Krem's done through with, we did that with Professor Mondoram. Okay and uh, have they told you that once they are unable to secure any bank financing how do they meet their financing requirements I mean what do they do after that? It varies some people go to family some people go to friends some people um, will take the risk and mortgage their property to produce the financing that they need. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Now, so let's uh, now come towards the end of our session and let's discuss our opinion on the pecking order theory from whatever that we have generated so far through this discussion. So from whatever we have discussed, I would first start off with what Keith said. Keith said, you will normally go for debt when you want to grow your business. You will not go for debt for operational purposes, All right? And um, Janet, taking that point a bit further to the case of the Black County scenario, problem is this that the people are going 
टू बैंक फॉर ऑपरेशनल नीड्स राइट अ बैंक इज हाईली लाइकली टू डिनाय देयर लोन एप्लीकेशन इफ दे गोइंग फॉर ऑपरेशनल रिक्वायरमेंट दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज वर्किंग कैपिटल लोन वर्किंग कैपिटल लोन इज एक्सट्रीमली डिफिकल्ट टू गेट फॉर एन एस एन आई बी वेरी ऑनेस्ट अबाउट दैट बिकॉज वट दे नीड टू डू इज दैट टू गेट अ वर्किंग कैपिटल लोन यू नीड टू शो वॉट योर इनकम हैज बीन एंड हाउ इन द नियर फ्यूचर यू आर गोइंग टू पे ऑफ दैट इंटरेस्ट रेट और द बैंक लोन फ्रॉम योर सेविंग्स let me explain to you what working capital loan is working capital is current assets minus current liabilities current assets are all those stocks and inventories or debts that you can get or convert into cash in less than 12 months current liabilities are all those liabilities expenses and payments that you have to give to people within 12 months right so working capital loans even for the best companies in time of the pandemic or in time of any economic crisis is very very difficult which is why they have to rely on internally generated profits or they have to rely on borrowing from friends and families now hanvisha i have a question for you here a very interesting question do you think your alternative sources of finance can help in financing working capital requirements i uh, sorry i can't hear you you'll have to unmute i keep on forgetting <laughs> Um, yeah, that's actually what we are trying to work on because we know that the debt financing is very difficult, especially during this uh, pandemic time. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to see firms and especially SMEs, wherever they are at the business stages and the financial needs, mm -hmm. if they're gonna follow, how they're gonna follow the pecking order? Is it gonna be from the family and friends or equity? especially at the government policy what government are doing actually to be able to support those businesses mm -hmm. so i would say that yeah it's quite interesting actually to 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 know that exactly uh, yeah so the that's what the that's exactly what my point is that working capital is actually where sme struggle the most let me be honest with you because um that is the actual make or break point if you are able to have some significant working capital to finance your business you will grow if you do not have significant working capital for your business you will fail that is a make or a break point so another problem is i'll be very frank is that people are unable to explain their working capital requirements when they come to a uh, financial institutions especially smes because what happens with them is that these are people who do not have very strong financial background these people are like they 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 are running a restaurant right so they know how to prepare very good food they know how to give excellent customer services they know how to have a very good level of ambience in their restaurant but if you say to them that you know tell a bank your working capital requirements they will struggle even the best of them because you need to have a very high level of financial literacy that is something that especially in the smes people underestimate a lot which is that if you really want to go to a bank and get a bank loan you need to have some level of financial literacy you should be able to convince a bank that you know this is what my working capital requirements are these are what come under my current assets 
this is what comes under my current liabilities. This is the amount of money that I want, right? And then a bank will, you know, take your application even more seriously. You may consider yourself the best chef in the world. You may be the best teacher in the world. But if you can't explain to a bank what your working capital requirements are, you will struggle to get a bank loan. So Janet, that is a bit of a solution to the problem that you are in encountering as well. That in order to avail bank financing, yeah, we need to assess what is their financial literacy level. Okay. Then what we need to do is that we need to explain to these people the basics. So that when they walk into a bank, they know how to present their business from a banker's position. Right? They know how to use those finance and those banking terminologies when they are entering a bank. So in that case, you would see that then their loan acceptance rate can improve significantly. Right? Okay, so Keith, what is your take on the pecking order theory? What would you say about it? Um, I, I, I don't know about following it. Um, I, I take it into account. Um, I, you know, and to you know, to a great extent, the order in which the elements are set out confirm what I know and what we've effectively been doing over the past five years. Or so, All right. So Keith, I said because this because your point is very, very relevant, the one that you said in the start, which is, this is what I also believe. If you want to grow your business, you will not follow the pecking order theory. If you want to grow your business, debt will be your first priority. If you want to stay, you know, like I said, meet the working capital requirements, you want to survive right now, because you are a small or a medium enterprise, right? Which is struggling in the pandemic, you will follow the pecking order theory. You will use internally generated profit first. Why? Because debt is a commitment. It's a long-term commitment. When you go to a bank, then these are monthly payments that you have to make, right? It's not just about convincing the bank, it's about controlling your future cash flows also as well. So that's why we say that this topic on following the pecking order is not as easy as it seems. It's a very diverse topic. It actually depends upon what stage of the company life cycle you are in and all of these on all such factors, which makes this very challenging, right? So overall, one final, uh, I think we have, we have, we have we're just uh, gone a bit on ahead of time. So just to why my final comments on this one. Yes, there has been problems as far as the economic activity is concerned due to Brexit, due to the pandemic. But I think see things improving as the lockdown is going to uh, ease out. People are desperately waiting to come out of their homes and you know get things back to normal so in my own personal point of view i th see things in a very positive manner but i will not underestimate like i said the importance of financial literacy if you want to get loans from banks if you want to get loans from the government even the business interruption scheme you must learn the basic financial terminologies to explain your financing requirements. Okay. So, all right, guys, it was wonderful to have you today. Wonderful to have you, Keith. Wonderful to have you, Hanvisha. Wonderful to have you, Janet. I really enjoyed the session with you. It is for, I really liked the way that all of you interacted with me. So thank you so much for coming. And, um, Karen has my email uh, details as well. So if you want to email me anything, I will be more than happy 
to give you my comments on that as well. Okay. So thanks. Just want to say thank you very much for the uh, yeah, presentation. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Um, there is another um, e-clinic happening on the 30th of June, and that's the psychology of um, crisis leadership. If anybody's interested, uh, go on to Eventbrite and log on and book there. We've also got a dedicated email address, which is execed exec at wlv.ac.uk. That's E-X-E-C-E-D at wlv.ac.uk. If anybody's got any suggestions for further clinics, if you want to provide us feedback on what you've encountered today, or if you've got any questions for me or Arslan, then please use that to, to drop us an email. Um, unless anybody's got any other questions, um, and if you have, please feel free to ask them. Um, if not, I will close the meeting uh, and bid you all a good afternoon. So does anybody have any other questions? No? Okay then. Thank you very much you. for your attendance. Uh, and uh, have a good afternoon all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.